we can also look into this about the, you know, step back and look into the, what happens between the human and computer, right? So it, it looks like, a, I mean, it's an engaging story, but at the same time, there are so many challenges we don't, you know, talk about that much or we cannot kind of share all the time, uh, which, I, which I try to, right? So that's my main area is that, hey, computers are challenging and they're not human, so we have to be, we have to have insight and so on and so forth. So that's me. Uh, so here you can pick one, right? So I can ask you, is it zero or one? Is it duck or rabbit? Uh, and what happens is neither our lives nor design is linear or binary, right? So zeros and ones or ducks or rabbits are not the only answers because there are crocodiles, right? So this is exactly the same image. And what I'm doing is I'm juxtaposing this crocodile image to the beak of the duck and seeing a crocodile there. So this is ambiguity. And what designers do is this is the tension between ambiguity and computation. Computation wants a solid world, very stiff, very concrete. You know the answers or you're looking for the answers, but even if you have 10,000 designs, they are still within a limited set of, you know, designs. So they're either ducks or rabbits. But the, but the real innovation, like a huge leap happens when you discover the crocodile. So the question is, how can we use this kind of understanding and expand our, you know, use of computation to include ambiguities. It's a very challenging uh, uh, question. So, and I spent five years on this, you know, uh, doing the PhD. Uh, this is a close up uh, of one of my oil paintings. And my argument is, okay, try to compute this and you won't be able to, I don't know what's going on, right? So because I paint and, you know, I put stuff together and something emerges. Well, there are rules actually. So you can, you can do a little bit. And this was for that, this is a, little machine, maybe I could call it, that I built during my PhD. It is a projector and a camera. Uh, and what happens is you draw something and you can capture it with the camera and then project that underneath the paper. But before projecting, if you, let's say, just made a simple stroke or a curve, let's say a curve like this, you can keep rotating the curve and make a pattern. Very simple, right? Once you project that pattern, something interesting emerges because your paint is still there and there's an underlying let's say, uh, kind of like a pattern layout that you can work with. Uh, I'm gonna show what's happening here. So here is the deal, right? So this is, this is the final watercolor painting and drawing, it's a blend. What's happening is that this is the first, very first single curve uh, on the paper, and this is the pattern that is projected underneath. And the difference in, in computation, what you have to do is you have to go and sample this, crop it out, erase something or replicate it and so on, which is the pattern itself, right? So that's the computational side. But as a human, if you trace, your trace is never as perfect as the, you know, the, the pattern itself. You are not repeating anymore. Or the other opportunity is, hey, just changing my mind. I can't, I'm gonna switch to watercolor and start painting over these areas, right? With the blue uh, watercolor painting. So suddenly your rules are changing on the way and you are not bound to the computational, you know, program anymore. You keep breaking, but you can bring it back over and over again. And something very simple, but which turned out to be super interesting for me were these circles. They don't exist, right? So they don't exist in the pattern. They don't exist literally or directly in this, these patterns you see, but it's suggested by the arc. So suddenly the drafting person or the painter grabs something, you know, and just uh, draws those circles is an interesting moment. And maybe the claim here also is that the, it's very tangible. So the tangible medium or media is pretty interesting that it's our connection to the world. So we are not really fully isolated from, let's say, what we are trying to achieve here. Uh, this is called shape grammars. If you're, you know, probably you already heard about it. And uh, what happens is that you can both generate designs and paintings, but at the same time, you can retrospectively uh, go back to what you have done and try to explain it in quote-unquote computational terms, right? So that's the idea. So here again, the, the drawing starts with this cross sign or the plus sign, whatever that is on the left side, very simple. And you make a, you know, one pattern of nine parts and one pattern of nine parts and they juxtapose. And then that red shape is not there, right? So the, you have to be, you need human vision to trace something like that because it's not exactly, uh, it doesn't have that those boundaries defined by the machine, right? So that's the power of being human. That's the crocodile again, it's not the duck or rabbit there. 
And the nice thing is this, this painting or drawing, whatever you want to call it, it's, it's described in a very like a, a computational way. It's a calculation actually. The only difference is you don't use numbers, you don't use symbols, you use shapes to calculate and your shapes change all the time. So you're like in this uh, unbound, you know, a world of, hey, I changed my mind. It's not, it's, I think this is a variable, X is equal to one, but then you can say, hey, I'm gonna make X three or whatever, this edge of the shape. So you can cheat all the time, which is a lots of fun. And I kept doing this a lot uh, during the PhD. This is another drawing, which is like dragon like shapes. And you can see the, you know, how the drafter is or, or the painter is uh, duplicating your own work. So in a way, actually building a style is copying yourself all, all the time, right? So all the, all the famous painters we know or the older famous architects, you know, they keep doing the same thing. It's slightly different. It's just copying yourself. And that's how you become uh an expert in what you do actually in and develop a style right so this is referring to that and again this is a computation too in a way okay and then this is a little let's say sculptural piece that i made using those i use this for teaching too right so copying uh is it plagiarism or is it a tool for creativity well probably the second one uh because you can take artwork you can look into parts you can extract parts and you can make your own designs out of them, right? So these are from the first year students uh, at RISD, RISD, Rhode Island School of Design uh, Foundation students. Uh, and it was like visually super immersive, right? So they keep applying this copying and copying and, you know, basic, uh, let's say transformation rules and they end up creating these uh, drawings. This is super interesting. I'm gonna give, tell you this one. So this guy went into this painting and just picked one single part out of it, which is this part, and then generated other three parts using only that and generated the circular painting using only these, you know, four, let's say, parts. And he did it all by hand, by the way, no scripting was included. So I was amazed to see this, but you see the computation, right? So he was like, he was fitting this visually in an, the, you need a nesting, uh, nesting algorithm, just uh, hire this guy. So he was, he was pretty amazing. Uh, and then, you know, we expanded this by using uh, other types of drawings, projections, and so on and so forth.